This is a very risky profession because you can do everything that you're supposed to do and you might not get a crop. Starting very small and very incremental allows me to adapt to the market. I always try to look for solutions that are present in nature so that we are not fighting what naturally wants to happen. I don't have a lot of tools because uh, you don't really need a lot for farming. You know, there are days that I'm hauling compost around and I wish I had a tractor, but at the same time, it involves burning fuel, which I hate. Uh, you need a place to house the tractor, you need to maintain it. So it's, yeah, I'm not quite there yet. I only work with basically hand tools and electric tools. For example, I'll show you this. This is called the uh, Quick Cuts Greens Harvester. Uh, which is made by a company called Farmer's Friend in the U.S. And you can see it has a blade down here. When you pull the, the drill, that moves the, the blade sideways. And then these things basically push the greens into the basket. So you basically run it like this. And you run through the greens. And then in no time, the basket is full of greens and you're done. It only works if you have a perfectly even stand of greens. Because if you have greens that are different heights or some that are flowering and some that are not, I almost spend more time picking things out after than harvesting with a knife. I don't use it super, super often, but when, when I do, it saves an immense amount of time. For example, in this case, I don't use the, the harvester. When the kale is like this tall and it's all uniform, it's great. But at this stage, Everything has little different heights and there are leaves that are not really nice like this, so those I don't put in. So it gives me a higher level of quality control. I always put a lot of emphasis on quality because if, if you don't have quality, people are not going to come back. Because it's less convenient to shop here than shop at a grocery store. So you have to sort of overwhelm them with quality. This is a cedar called the Yang, Yang Cedar. It's an amazing tool as well. It has this shoe that opens a trench in the soil and then the, the seed basically drops from the hopper through that cone there and then this thing closes the trench. This wheel as you go is moving the gears and those gears move a roll inside and there are rolls of different sizes for different seeds and then the seeds drop are collected here, roll and drop. So that's how it works, it's very, very simple. It needs no maintenance. I can basically sow one of my beds of carrots in like three minutes. So imagine, compare that to like sowing by hand. Well, especially because there's one of you. So these labor saving devices yeah. must just be critical to your success. Absolutely. This is called the paper pot transplanter. So you basically put a tray here. And then this thing here opens the trench on the soil and then you move this way so you pull this backwards and then the plants unravel like this and they get put in the trench that this dug and then these things on the wheels close the trench behind. These are transplanted with a paper pot transplanter at two inches spacing. So we have two tunnels, neither of them are heated. It's just to give us a couple weeks in the spring and a couple weeks in the fall extra and also a bit of extra heat and shelter for crops that need it like the tomatoes and peppers which don't like to be wet. This is the nursery. This used to be a winter chicken coop. Eventually I built this which is a, it's like a passive solar nursery. It is not active now but in the shoulder season that fan up there is connected to a thermostat so when the greenhouse gets hot the fan basically takes all the hot air from the top of the greenhouse and runs it through these beds which are full of rocks and then the rocks absorb the heat and then they release it at night so in you know the middle of march when it's still like minus 10 at night outside it doesn't freeze in here and it's all just run by that fan so it's not any additional heating and then in the summer the nursery is pretty underutilized, so this year I bought some grow bags and we're also growing sweet potatoes in there, which like a very hot and humid environment, so that's perfect. And the uh, barrels have water also to absorb heat and use it as a heat battery. Okay. This is a, it's basically a rot and proof storage area. It has hardwood cloth basically everywhere so that the mice cannot go through. 
because they can chew through wood and everything but not through this so when we don't want things to get into our stuff i believe in physical exclusion so you see row covers or insect netting in the garden uh, and this type of thing and for example this corn is elevated so the the mice cannot jump in here and eat it making sure that they cannot get into the food and then you know they chew on the veggies and stuff like that once in a while i believe in sharing and also it's actually a lot less effort to share than to try to wipe everything out and uh, obviously it's, it's that's a lost battle like, you cannot fight nature so our our mantra here is to cooperate and not try to fight against it i mostly grow quick growing crops so we grow a lot of uh, salad greens also root veggies like carrots beets turnips radishes alberto maybe you can tell us a bit about the drip irrigation system that you've got yeah absolutely watering by hand will be totally not doable because it it takes so much time the drip has multiple benefits they last a long time, even though it's it's a lot of plastic. I haven't found an alternative, but uh, those are four years old and they're they're doing just fine because we filter all the water that goes through the drip so that the drip doesn't get clogged. I use sprinklers in my first couple of years, but they waste a lot of water, and they're also watering the pathways, and then they basically create a good habitat for weeds. So it's a bit counterproductive. So this is a homemade hose reel. So if I need to water like very small transplants that need a bit more water than what the drip can provide. I use this. And our soil is very sandy. So the top three inches of the soil dry out very quickly. And it's very fluffy. Like you can poke your finger in here, no problem. Right? Oh yeah. Which, uh, it just sinks right down. Yeah. What you see on the surface is basically compost. So the compost gets hydrophobic if it gets really dry. And then if we water basically the drip the drips of water just run on the on the uh, surface it's a good idea to keep it moist you see it here then when i took my finger off there is there's a lot of moisture in here but it's because it, it it rained pretty good on friday and also over the weekend a little bit we use rogue or insect netting for uh all the plants in the cabbage family because we have tiny beetles called flea beetles and they poke holes in the leaves and they're perfectly edible still but they don't look very nice uh, so this is for example baby kale with turnips and radishes this is the root cellar uh, it's covered in soil for insulation a lot of root cellars are dug into the ground we couldn't dig it very deep because our water table is really high so we didn't want to have to deal with flooding problems and having to have a, a pump getting rid of the water because again we are trying to design things so that we don't need to use energy so instead we're using the energy of the earth to keep that from freezing in the winter it has a bit of insulation in the most exposed areas but the soil is what's providing most of the insulation and these pipes that you see there are vents so some of them are bringing fresh air in and some of them are taking the sort of stale humid air out and that's critical for maintaining the veggies in good condition. It has two chambers so that we can keep veggies that don't store well together separate. So for example, fruit like apples, uh, they release ethylene, which is a plant hormone that accelerates ripening. So if we were to keep the apples with potatoes, for example, the potatoes will sprout immediately. So that's why we did two chambers so that we could keep them separately. Um, both chambers have independent vents so that the air doesn't mix. We are in, mid in the middle of August and these are still from last year. It's not only extending the season in which we can sell veggies, but it's also giving us a lot of food security. Those solar panels basically produce all the energy that we need. Uh, so we are tied to the grid because we were concerned about the, uh, all the materials and the environmental impacts of the batteries. Uh, so we decided to be tied to the grid because that infrastructure was already here. And the reason why that solar panel is powering our whole needs is because our needs are very small and that's by design. You can do everything that you're supposed to do and do the same thing year after year or for whatever reason, the weather or whatever it might be. 
you might not get a crop and then you don't have anything to sell and food already sells for very cheap. Again, this is a very risky profession and I tip my hat to all the farmers out there that are paying their mortgage farming because I cannot imagine how stressful that must be because I'm already stressed out and I don't have to pay a mortgage. My first year, I didn't have this shed and I was gardening basically three quarters of that garden. Then the following year I built this shed and I did the last quarter. Then the following year I built a nursery. Then the following year we did the flowers and the berries. The following year the agroforestry. So it's all very incremental and that allows me to adapt to the market. So I know what sells and what doesn't and I can plant more of what sells, right? So to uh, make sure that the farm is economically viable. And also my expenses are tiny, right? My tools are very simple. I don't have to pay for fuel. I don't pay for fertilizers. I don't pay for chemicals. The biggest expense is my own labor. A lot of farms don't get in the green until like year six or seven, right? And I was in the green on year three. But that's again, because I have a very supportive community and I'm very small and very lean. So I have a salad subscription, which is sort of following the uh, CSA model. People select how many greens and how many garnishes they want at the beginning of the season and they pay up front. And then they come every week or I deliver to them. I also have an email list with almost 300 people. And I send uh, an email every Monday with a list of what we have. And then people can order from there with a no previous commitment. And then again, they can come and pick up where I can deliver. And then I also supply a local health food store and then probably five to seven restaurants. And that's mostly how I sell. I was expecting something great, but this is just so inspirational. Amazing, I'm yeah. glad. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure.